So if you guys have questions for the panel, yes? Um, yes. I have a comment and a question. Um, first, the synopsis. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, first, the synopsis means a lot of things to a lot of people, and I was here last year when Greg Becker spoke to the same issues you guys are talking to, and I'm a county commissioner and a fire chief in Jackson County, and oil and gas has kind of taken off. We're a standalone countywide fire department with no mutual aid, so we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. And thanks to my contact with Greg here, like Josh said, he, he came to North Park and did a training for our fire department, and since that training, we have changed a lot of the things that we do because we were educated in a better fashion equipment-wise and response-wise. We've had three incidents since he was there, and they were handled completely different since that visit. So my hat's off for that part of it because it doesn't mean this portion of what you're talking about doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people here. But when you're, re you're headed towards the problem, when everybody's headed away, it's mm -hmm. a big deal. My question to industry was I'm not aware that the, the people that are operating in Jackson County have – are. Is it, a, is it an, a standard for people on those well sites to have somebody that's certified to move somebody out of a hazardous environment with SCBAs, or is that just depending dependent on each cooperator? Do you want me to take that? I'll give it, okay. I'll give it a quick shot. Um, I think it depends on the, si the situation. I think like what Reed said, they have um, a certain area that they have known H2S concentrations. And when you have situations like that that are known, you develop those protocols. Where you do not have those situations that are known, it's just kind of a standard operating environment, you do not have those expectations for um, SCBA training or, or uh, evacuation training, things like that for that specific um, requirement. Okay, I'm just curious, because I don't think they do. I think that falls out to our fire department to do that, which we're capable of doing, but I just didn't know if it's something they're lacking in and they need to do, or. And on that part, I would say just back to the communication, to go have a meeting with your operator and, and come up with, hey, is this a need, a gap? Should you look at that for training for your folks instead of just relying on us? Yeah. And I think you'll come up with a very uh, yeah. positive situation and they may just say, you know, we need to do a little more training. Or it may say, we don't have this situation very often and it does, you know, residually lie, you know, with that emergency response aspect for, for your service at that point. I have a question. Um, what industry incidences trigger notifications to the public and media outside of emergency situations? Is it the industry's or local government's responsibility to inform and report to the public? I'll take that, I guess. Um, so a couple of things that we look at from Well County is um, I think from the notification of the public, if, if it's a threat to the public, so if there's, if there's um, well, the term is receptor, so are there buildings, homes, um, waterways, those types of things close in, in close proximity to or that could be threatened by that incident, um, that falls back onto the, the first responders. I, I think um, the other thing that we look at is um, within Weld County, we're, we are, I would say, well blessed having a really good um, public information network amongst all of our agencies, um, our county, um, our law enforcement organizations. So we make sure that the one thing that we don't do is step on someone's toes, but also we, the thing we don't want to do is send out information from, the, from a government standpoint without having that communication with the operators. So we have a really good public information network um, communicating, communicating back and forth as what's going on. Um, we have that process of there, if it's emergency information that needs to go out to citizens, reverse 911, communicating out that way. Um, if it's press release information and stuff like that, we will put out a press release based on what actions we are doing, not what the fire district is doing, not what the operators are doing, stuff like that. But again, we want to make sure that that message is coordinated amongst all of us. Um, typically, if it's an incident at a facility, uh, we're going we're gonna to let that operator handle that information, that press release information. And we'll get phone calls, hey, you know, what are, they, what are they doing to get that put out? It's like, you know what, I can give you the name and number of their public information officer, and they'll be happy to have that, um, or communications officer. They'll be happy to, um, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer questions for you. Um, but again it, it, again, it goes back to that, you know, before you have that incident, you need to know who those folks are. Um, and again, I think um, from our first response um, network that we have, 
um, with our fire districts and, and sheriff's office. Um, they work really good together, um, even to the point of if, if it's at, you know, if it's in the middle of Platteville and they're, they're inundated with a call and they're bringing support, support in, we have a lot of public information officers with other fire districts that will come in and help that fire district to, um, to release that or push that information out as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I'll just quick add to that just uh, briefly. That's the same for any emergency response, whether it's a, you know, a truck right. with you know, fuel driving down the highway that has an accident. You know, with that same type of communication happens regardless. It's not just an oil and gas specific thing. Um, and again, it comes down to that, that local municipality. I'll go back to our Broomfield agreement with North Metro Fire. Um, that community wanted some certain things with regards to exactly your question. How do, how do we communicate with the public um, and at the end of the day, we develop that within our emergency response planning um, pieces. That's the 24 meetings that I mentioned with that group. Um, I can't tell their citizens when and how to evacuate if they need to, whether it be my thing or, or somebody, you know, a truck driving down the street. That's, that's the emergency planner. So we worked in with our framework on if we do have something, how do we trigger that piece so that that reverse 911 that Roy mentioned can be triggered effectively again, regardless of whether it's me or anybody else. And again, what I mentioned, that work for what we've done has made that system better so that, you know, if somebody needs to use it for, you know, any emergency within that jurisdiction, that network is tested <coughs> and pr improved. Um, so again, come back to that communication, work with that operator, um, and I think you'll be amazed at, at what additional benefits you'll get well beyond um, just what interaction between oil and gas and the community has. Roy, I had a question. You had a, a pretty dramatic picture of the, the lightning strike incident. What was the impacted distance of that event? You know, I don't remember exactly. I, the, um, so it was the first slide, the first picture. Um, the, yeah, the, the front page of the Tribune. That's great. Um, it was pretty, su pretty substantial size. It was, I think the tank, the tank battery that they had there, I think there was um, six or eight tanks. Um, it was a pretty good size footprint. Um, the one thing that was that I would say is um, it it was large enough. There was a there was a residence to the east of that facility, but the re residence was not damaged. Um, pretty re pretty good response. Uh, we had several fire agencies that responded into that, so it wasn't just like one fire district handled handled that by themselves. So I don't know if that that answers. I don't have it, it was. I can't say it was. 500 feet out or, or a thousand foot or something like that. I don't have that information. Roy, I can speak to that to, oh. to answer your question. Yeah, Greg, go ahead. Um, we, Greeley Fire was the primary agency responding to that. And if you look at those tactical response plan cards, the entire incident was contained in that 250 feet um, hot zone. Thanks, Greg. Would you please uh, describe how you engage contractors in your emergency uh, preparedness and, and response? It depends on the scenario. We, um, we uh, have an FRP facility, so it's regulated by EPA because of water storage. And so within that FRP, that facility response plan, we have contractors designated who would be responders to an incident in that water scenario. And so we do training with them and we know what their certifications are and we know what resources they have and can provide and we actually try and assign those things ahead of time. It becomes difficult because people come into and leave the oil field all the time, but it's something we try and keep up with. And so for some of those more major planning scenarios, we do meet with contractors, understand their capabilities and the resources that they bring to the table, and then implement them when we can. Does that cover that? And then on, on our aspect uh, for our operations, like the tactical cards and the uh, kind of that emergency response protocol, the tabletops, we engage with our vendors, whether it be the drilling contractor. Um, we do drills on a daily basis with the drilling guys um, for each facility or for each site. Um, and then when it goes to the completions phase, uh, same sort of thing. We don't do drills on a daily basis, but we do um, drills on a weekly basis with them and engage them again on here's what that response protocol looks like. Um, you know, our all the communication matrix that is a part of that. So they're well integrated within the trainings that that we mentioned during the presentation.
And, and I'll add to that too really quick. We have contractor expectations that we, we put in our master service agreements. So we, we outline the specific training that we, we require to be on our locations. Uh, I, I, one quick question. Uh, so the Greeley, Greeley Tribune or the Denver Post puts together a news feed of how much, how much spills happens each month, right? So go into how much of that is cleaned up quickly and never reaches a waterway or groundwater. In addition to that, you know, crude biodegrades pretty quickly, but you guys accelerate that biodegradation with bioremediation. So what techniques do you use to do that when you clean up spills quickly? So I'll take a first quick shot at that. The, I think the report you're mentioning, you know, Greeley Tribune puts together a spill report. Any, any of the reportable spills in that criteria that Reed mentioned in his presentation, uh, we'll hit that news feed. And whether it's a, you know, within lined containment, most of those are well within lined containment and never hit the ground. Um, and so we just will clean those up um, and kind of recycle the oil back into the tank, um, and it's taken care of. Um, if there's other ones that actually do, you know, hit the ground, um, you know, we have a variety of methods to do it. A lot of it's just like, imagine if you're, you know, you're working on a dirt driveway, uh, changing your oil, um, and you have an oil drop or, you know, you, you miss your drip pan, right? How would you clean that up? Same sort of thing. We'll, we'll kind of dig that out. Um, there's at times we remediate that or times we take it to an approved disposal facility where it kind of has uh, an enhanced method to, work on that remediation aspect of it and then same thing i think with you know any surface water um there's a lot a variety of those methods that do it um i don't have a like you I can let you talk more about that i think sure you guys do i mean you can i'm a safety guy so <laughs> take that into account when i uh answer about environmental stuff but um you know 99.8 percent of our spills are something you could probably pick up with a shovel like he's saying with the drip pan. We do a lot of that on location. Go ahead, pick up that soil, segregate it out, and go ahead and just bucket remediate it. Um, if it's larger than that, uh, there are many techniques, uh, depending on what the composition of the fluid is, whether it's produced water, whether it's oil, um, skimming ponds, that sort of thing to pull oil off the top, or when you get into produced water, you start, um, we can aerate, like you said, with the bio, we can try and feed oxygen to that water source, say it's a pond, something like that. We can turn that water over. We can try and aerate that. We can get those microbes going and try and break down some of that residual hydrocarbon. When it comes to water, salts are a little bit different. That's a little bit more difficult. But those, those incidents, thankfully, are few and far between. Um, for some perspective, we just um, tabulated the numbers for us yesterday. Last year, we moved 30 million barrels of water, and we lost... 0.03% of that on the ground, maybe. It, it really is crazy, the amount of fluids that we move around in, on a day-to-day -day basis. I was only just going to add that when we do have an incident that um, requires significant remediation, we're working with COGCC, we're working with our regulators for an approved method, and we're working together to get that done as fast as we possibly can. Yeah, those, those long-term remediations, um, if it's not just something that happens quickly, is something that's actually planned out with regulators and agreed upon. So, Roy, you had a number of pretty dramatic photos there, uh, all of which, if I understand correctly, are incidents that have happened in the last five years in Weld County. Mm -hmm. So from an emergency management perspective, uh, professional's perspective, and in the context of SB 181, what do you think is reasonable and necessary for a reasonable setback for residential sites from operations like that? So from a, here's, here's one of the things I look at, and I, I, I don't know, I, I would say I, I'm not, uh, I don't have enough knowledge of saying what's, what's an appropriate setback. I think what, it, uh, again, it goes back to Let's look at the planning process. Let's look at what what is out there, what's developed. I think um, not from a scientific study, but most of the incidents, you know, talking with our fire districts and stuff, most of the incidents that we have had within Weld County have been in that in that hot and cold zone, so that 250 to 500 foot footprint, um, based on whether it's a lightning lightning incident, whether it's a um, something happening at a drilling site, something happening at a, um, at a fracking site. 
So I think um, if, if that's what we need to do, that, those are, that's that footprint that we need to look at. Um, I think most of, most of what we have had has been contained to what I would call that footprint of that, of that location. Um, I think overall the number one thing that I would say has been the benefit of understanding what's going on is that communication with the operators, the coordination, understanding what facilities we have, looking at a risk assessment and what does that look like. I mean, that, I, I could spend probably a half hour just talking about risk assessments and what, what that looks like. Um, so I'd be happy to give you my card and we can talk, we can talk about that at, at a future time. But I think, I think really the, the reality would be is understanding where those locations are, understanding um, what's at risk and what are, what are the safety precautions that the industry and the first responders can take to help um, with when we do have those incidents. Thank you. You bet. I can make a quick comment to that. Um, when we get into more of our midstream facilities like we're talking about, then we start seeing more regulations like PSM or RMP with the EPA and you designate a facility based on what you're storing there, right? And so the size of a facility would then dictate whether it is um, regulated or not. You could apply a similar logic, right? What's the size of this facility? Okay, then how far away should it be? Um, you know, setting things in permanent stone is always difficult, right? But if we approach it in a, like a conscientious way and we do the risk assessment, we can then make wiser decisions about where things should be and how they should be situated. Yeah, good point. Do we have a few more minutes? I think we do. I, I was going to ask each of you, can you provide one recommendation for successful collaboration? I mean, I, I think it's something we all hit on at some point, and it, it, it's the face-to-face -face time. It's the knowing somebody um, and kind of breaking down whatever perceptions you have about the industry or sheriff's department or firefighters, and when you start to understand what people bring to the table, what they know, what they don't know, what resources they have, it, it just goes a long way to building confidence, building trust, and, an, and being an effective in an emergency scenario. I think the, um, the one thing I would say to that is, um, you know, from the, from the emergency management world, the one thing that we do is, I mean, my, our whole role is um, communication and coordination with all of our agencies, organizations, and, and communities and stuff like that. And I, don't, and I don't think we would be where we're at without the, the assistance from the different fire districts. Um, several of our fire districts have fire marshals. They're, they're involved with that. We have several in our audience. Um, that have looked at these emergency plans, that have looked at the, the tactical response plans and said, hey, I think we need to add this, or, you know, or it's like, hey, we're looking at this and it's, um, you know, it's redundant. We're saying the same thing on, the same, on two documents, and how do we, how do we shorten that up? Um, so I think, that, I think it comes back to that it's, um, again, it's working together, making sure we know who the, who the folks are um, that are working in our communities. Um, one thing that we did, um, from our, from our offices, we sent out a survey a couple of years ago just asking um, the, the first responders to, to answer questions like, do you know who the operators are in, in your fire district? Do you know how to reach them, how to coordinate with them, and have you had any, any meetings with them? And the, re the, resounding, um, the resounding answer was, I don't know, who, I don't know everybody that's operating in my, in my district. Um, I don't have contact information for them. So one of the, one of the outcomes of that was, putting together a list and we have a couple of different organizations that compile lists of pipeline operators and drilling operators in our in our county and that you know it's always updated we get new people new companies kind of coming in and those cards are going out routinely now so again I think it comes back to it's the face-to-face -face communication it's working with our districts um, I don't think we would be where we're at if we didn't have that um, combined um, coordination and working together yeah, not much more to add on to what they mentioned, but I think just taking those best practices and um, like that mentioned that the co-op thing that we've been working on, that's available, uh, I think, for anybody that is interested in that on a statewide basis. So um, there's a lot of information out there. We want to share it with you um, so that you can have it, use it. And I think, again, the end of the day, the trainings and things that, that we do, um, because we want to practice and, and, and be ready, 
is used and more beneficial on a day-to-day -day basis for first responders than, than what we you know, would use it for because we don't use that service very much. Um, and I think that's a takeaway from you know, what we've been able to collaborate on from the industry to first responders. 